Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bassam Haddad. I am hosting this uh, 25th session of the Gaza and Context Collaborative Teaching Series. I'm delighted to have with me the remarkable Rana Barakat from Ramallah, Palestine, who will be addressing the uh, very important topic from an ongoing Nakba to ongoing return. And she will be unpacking uh, precisely what that means. I'll say a couple of words about the event and then I'll introduce Rana. Um, but first, uh, before we go anywhere, um, so uh, Rana, Kifik. This is the, the answer. As we say here, when people ask, whereas I say, uh, and I learned this from a friend, uh, you say whatever. Um, Ahlan wa sahlan, Rana. Uh, Rana will be addressing the uh, uh, this topic on ongoing rakba and ongoing return. Um, while the conceptual and material rea reality of the ongoing Nakba is increasingly, incredibly relevant in understanding Palestinian history, uh, our guest today will address how the ongoing Nakba is but one part of the larger framing of ongoing return. Through the conceptual framing of ongoing return, she will try to show how violence in all its forms works to foreclose our thinking as it eliminates our present slash our presence slash present. Ongoing return is a way to think about how the past and present forge our imaginations towards our futures as Palestinians and with Palestine. Um, Rana Barakat uh, basically has a very long bio. She's extremely accomplished and I have to uh, cut it down in order for us to yeah. keep moving forward. Uh, she is Associate Professor of History. <laughs> she is Associate <laughs> Professor of History at Birzeit University in Palestine and Director of the uh, B. Birzeit University Museum. Her research interests include the history and historiography of colonialism, nationalism, and and cultures of resistance. She is currently working on a book monograph titled Lifta and Resisting the Mu Museumification of Palestine, Indigenous History of the Nakba, which advances an indigenous understanding of time, space, and memory in Palestine by focusing on the details of the people and the and place of Lifta village over time. Uh, again, Ahlan wa sahlan, um, Rana, uh, we will actually have you uh, address this topic and then uh, I'll lead with some questions. And if we have some time, we will actually go to audience questions, although we usually disappoint our audience because we run out of time. The floor is yours and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. I should actually say that even though I shared that biography with you, the title of the book has changed into Ongoing Return. Um, Hopefully. I'm not sure how well I'll unpack it, but I'm going to try to present it, Bassam. So thank you. The unimaginable violence of this iteration of the genocide against Palestine and Palestinians has been difficult to place into historical context, as necessary as it is to do that. So I want to begin today to recognize that simple yet paralyzing reality. I need to acknowledge the hard work of my friends and colleagues in tr who've been trying to move mountains including demanding our historical context and how we speak to this madness of Israeli genocidal violence, all the while insisting on the power of our voices. <clears throat> In this series alone on Jadalia, we've had the opportunity to hear profoundly important interventions by people who have and continue to teach us. Their voices puncture the madness of general settler genocide. It is not in humility on my part to acknowledge that I simply do not have the wherewithal to be nearly that coherent. So consider that a disclaimer. And perhaps, rather than teach in, today we can present this as a think in. In its sum thus far, this collection that we have online through the Jadalia teachings, and it is my honor that Birzeit University Museum is an institutional part of this series, has presented among others, Palestinian historians as a part of the larger collection, who have given us profoundly important historical interventions, seeing Rashid Khaldi, Yusuf Munayir, Shirin Saikali, among others, dismantle colonial narratives that have occupied our own narratives, like the settler military has occupied the land of Palestine, is a reminder of how powerful our voices can be in the face of all of this. Their interventions in voice and in writing help me frame my thoughts today. 
in particular, as I've done so often over the last month and a half, I'm held by the notion of radical empathy that Shireen offered us to help me find coherence in all of this madness and in all of my rage and grief. It is with this notion of radical empathy and the communities that we have forged together that I've begun to find a frame for how love really is the point, even or especially in rage, because I am angry. In part, I should say I'm angry by how we are still working to advocate for Palestinian humanity, how we're still trying to insist on our narrative in the public discourse, even in the scholarly discourse. And I really want to work against my own impulse to talk back to Zionist fodder. It's not easy because with Zionist fodder comes relentless storms of Zionist settler colonial violence. This is at the heart of the work of thinking of an ongoing return not to counter the ongoing Nakba, but rather an attempt to explain how Palestinian belonging to Palestine is far more powerful. And for me, a far more profound way of understanding Palestinian pasts in the Palestinian present and as a core of hope for Palestinian futures. I need to stop and return to how hard this is. The existential question of how to think through a genocide. It's not a time for theorization, perhaps, and whatever kind of intellectual intervention I may muster here is wrought and heavy. Today has been unbearable in all of these months of unbearable. While this is not new, as we've been saying over and over again, the intensity of it, the brutality of the violence is more precedented, is more unprecedented than the past. And in every passing day, it becomes even more unprecedented. How many times have we all said this over the last 160 days? This never ending the never ending military assaults have killed more than 31,000 Palestinians and all of the sea and the land. And with each passing miserable day, the Zionist military machines bring more violence and death. Between 24 hours, between the 12th of March and the 13th of March, yesterday. Nearly 100 Palestinians were killed in Gaza. On the same day, the settler army, army murdered more, mur, sorry, murdered six Palestinians in the West Bank. Like every day before this, before it, we know that this is not a final figure because broken bodies under broken buildings remain yet uncounted. Tracking the numbers is a her Herculean task. These figures, for example, are from the Palestinian Ministry of Health a ministry still functioning at a moment when 458 healthcare workers have been killed. Between the relentless bombing and attacks throughout the Gaza Strip and the ongoing invasions in the West Bank, we are also witnessing the use of hunger in the long list of Israeli war crimes. If people are not being killed from the bombs, their, by, their bodies are succumbing to the lack of nourishment and intended spread of disease. In addition, we have the incomprehensible numbers of arrests across the geographies of all of occupied Palestine. According to the Palestinian Prisoner Society, since October, more than 7,500 Palestinians in the West Bank have been arrested by the settler military. And we still don't have any real clarity about arrests and forced captivity of Palestinians from Gaza. Each of these numbers is a person. Each holds stories of life and endurance. They are not just figures, nor should their lives be summarized by the atrocious conditions of their murder by the settler state and its military. Advocacy requires this kind of documentation, however light, lifeless it seems. And it is necessary, as a necessary part of screaming collectively to stop this bloody genocide. It is also a challenge because it asks us to present evidence, documentation, testimony of the violence of the Nakba. Given all we are, why are we forced to present people with documentation? Why must we continue to testify to all of this? Lest I be misunderstood, this empirical evidence is very necessary. And I want to honor and acknowledge the work of many, because I also trust that documenting this genocide, this attack on our people and peoplehood, on our cultural and material heritage is necessary. And so I present you with one of the many contradictions a historian can face in thinking about the past, through the present in Palestine. While many of us push against, if not, all, if not all out refuse, the necessity to document the dehumanization of Palestinian people, it is nevertheless a necessary part of our work. With all of this in mind, as I begin today, I want to try to tell a story of an ongoing return in the midst of this bloody ongoing Nakba. I am hesitant in even trying to tell a story under the weight of the genocide. And I wanna thank you again, Beth, 
the sound for your patience, for this is a talk that I've meant that I put off for months now. I must admit, I'm having a hard time with telling the story of what's happening now. And more than five months into the other core, violence that once seemed beyond description is now completely beyond comprehension. But it's also very, very real. Like others, however, I want to reaffirm that history still matters. The historical context of our conversation today is the Nekba and the ongoing Nekba. While, as I just mentioned, I want to talk about ongoing return, I have to begin with the Nekba and the ongoing Nekba in Palestine. That is, we have a word that holds the concept for what many of the scholars of settler colonialism describe in the famous words of Patrick Wolfe as a, set, as a structural violence of settler colonialism, Nekba and ongoing Nekba. Historians have often divided the Nakba War into stages, beginning in 1947 and the aftermath of the UN partition proposal that suggested cutting up the body of Palestinian land. These stages mark both the intensity of the violence on a metric of how centrally, centrally organized it was by either the Zionist militias or later the settler army. The stages also mark the geography of violence. To go through these stages, is to show how conquest and invasion functioned in the whole of the geography of Palestine, but also to review this history, the linear, his, linear history of signposts that indicate the stages of colonial violence, co sorry, colonial history in Palestine, however necessary it is, presents us, presents a challenge to me. Our stories are rarely linear, nor do they adhere to this way of understanding. And so even in thinking about the stages of the Nakba War, as I try to move into understanding the ongoing Nakba, I confront another contradiction. If I want to present stories and storytelling as a historical methodology in and about Palestine, circles are simply far more interesting than straight lines. These straight lines trace themselves onto a colonial narrative and a settler temporality. Moreover, these straight lines are the foundation and the logic of the structures of colonial modernity housed in places like museums and archives. That is, our lived stories are not only erased in the colonial narrative and the settler archives that hold this narrative, they never exist, existed within those structures. So why should we try to trace our circles onto their straight lines, even if we do so in a position of countering them? The simple explanation is played out in the daily violence of settler colonialism. This structural violence is bloody, destructive, and clearly genocidal. Settler colonialism cannot tolerate our past, just as settlers attack, constantly attack our present. Though countering the colonial and settler colonial narrative of Palestine has been a key part of Palestinian literature, I want to ask, can we consider why we're working to counter what disappeared us, continues to work to erase us as a foundational principle? Shall we work to find ourselves in these structures of power force a recognition for Palestine and Palestinians within it, or can we work to find another way? If we follow this power of recognition, conforming into the straight lines of linear narratives, the past informs our present how we have been forced to make our land claims. This narrative arch is based on the idea that we were once here, and therefore we can prove ownership of, what, of that once was. These claims are embedded in a political project towards achieving a nation state one that would be recognized both by the settlers and the imperial powers. The hold of nation state modernity on Palestinian politics has been suffocating. In this sense, in addition to the settler occupation on the land of Palestine, settler frameworks have also occupied our own frames and mechanisms of re relationality. Navigation, rather than exploring our own changing relationship with time and place then, becomes a kind of negotiation with the settler and within their settler logics. Again, forcing circles to become straight lines. This all reduces our belonging to Palestine into an adherence to a version of the past that is nothing more than a lost paradise that cannot be lived in the present and has no future. As such, not only do we compile a list of a history of loss, but our past is itself lost in this confinement. All we can do in this reductive and overdetermined framework is claim that Palestine is a place and as a land once belonged to us, a long lost past that can only be memorialized. 
I want to interrupt myself again here and call myself out for I'm trying to argue for another way of experiencing our past in the present. But this present, this ongoing nekba, is what's happening right now. It's an abyss and every day is worse. I'm not sure how rethinking the past can help people survive and endure this horrible, horrible present, honestly. But I shall continue. Straight lines versus circles. So we have dates that help us historicize the colonial occupation of Palestine. It's important to help people, ourselves and others, to understand that 1917 is a key date and a watershed moment for Palestinian history. It was an imperial moment that paved the way for military occupation of Palestine and the imperial commitment to the settler colonialization of Palestine. Likewise, it's important to understand the stages of the Nakba War, as I mentioned earlier, to illuminate how it continues in the ongoing Nakba. Rather than counter or prove, maybe this is a method to intentionally historicize from the river to the sea with all of the hills in between, to share what it actually means for Palestine, for Palestinians in terms of our belonging to Palestine. And so a modern Palestinian history has in many ways come to be defined by this word, Nakba. The catastrophe of Zionist settler colonialism and the violence involved on the body and the place of Palestine to create and maintain the settler state of Israel. Historians have produced a great deal of literature on the Nakba, beginning with the catastrophic event of the war that began in 1947. Even before 1947, we see Nakba as a word used to describe the violence waged against the people and land of Palestine in the colonial mandate period. As early as 1935, Munir Fakhreddin traces the word used by folks in Bissan the catastrophe of colonialism in Palestine obviously preceded the war, just as it has succeeded it. By August of 1948, in the midst of the brutal war that drove out three quarters of the Palestinian people from their homeland, Konstantin Zurek published Marna Nakba, the meaning of disaster, in which he gave the name to this war. Before and since Zurek's intervention, the word has been a political cry for Palestinians as their history, like their land, has been taken over by settler colonial structures and frameworks. The field of Palestinian history is certainly not a monolith, nor, it is, only, nor is it all only about the Nakba War. However apocalyptic that moment is presented in our fields of knowledge and experience. The Nakba War, as I mentioned, if we see it as a historical event, began in late 1947 and continued until mid-1949. It was, in the four it was the four stages of the implementation of Plan Dalet, or the Zionist plan, a plan to conquer and occupy all of, plan all of Palestine. Beginning from the sea, the first stage is concentrated on occupying and forcibly transferring Palestinians on the coast. From the sea into the heart of Palestine, from Yaffa into Al Quds, with the key of a Ramla in between, Zionist paramilitary and military forces waged a war and use tactics of the same logic that we see today. Albeit the machinery of genocide has changed, the intentions have not. The next stages of the war moved to further concentration in the south into the desert lands. Zionist forces continued their bloody campaigns, and by 1949, nearly 80% of the land of Palestine was occupied. But we all know that it didn't end there. So from the war, we glean the ongoing. That is, the ongoing Nakba is the settler colonial structure of violence imposed on Palestine and Palestinians. It has always been genocidal. It is a violence that seems never ending, and survival is not a post consideration to employ in retrospect because the violence remains omnipresent. And so our ongoing stories of Palestine are in part the history of settler colonial violence and a settler colonial state that continues to work to erase us. However, folding all of these stories into a framework of settler power and settler presence reinforces our erasure. Back to circles and lines. How can we engage stories and the method of storytelling that are both linked to, the in, to enduring the endless violence of settlers, but are also bigger and richer and are about life and vitality? I guess to summarize, I just don't want settlers to, the, to be the main actors in our stories. Here again, lies this historian's dilemma. Hegemonic Zionist mythology has been incorporated into the structure of settler colonial power and the brutality of what seems like never ending, unyielding and relentless violence as the material of our daily lives. 
This violence plagues our collective memory because it is the field that we navigate in our everyday present realities. As such, settler structural violence in the past and in our ongoing present creates a resonance that continues to plague collective Palestinian memory, as well as how we embody our navigation in relation to the land in time and over time. Given the layers of power imposed on memory and remembering, given the violence imposed on our bodies, I want to offer ongoing return, not as a means of obfuscating or ignoring violence, but rather I want us to think together. If we center belonging and love, if we use this as a means of understanding our relation, relationality to the land and to, the, to each other, to the past and the present, understandings that we borrow and share as a way as a method and way of being with other indigenous peoples who have endured and continue to endure settler colonial violence. Can our stories be freed from the confines of their straight lines? And again, I need to interrupt myself in this thinking because this is what has become the main conceptual thread for my current manuscript, a book I've been working on for far too long and one that keeps being challenged by the settler colonial realities we endure. Thinking through fire is hard enough, writing through it as well, I don't even know. I don't know that this series, I do know that this series is, is meant in part to be a pedagogical tool. So per, perhaps that is what I can offer today to every student listening, and I hope we all still consider ourselves students. That part of following or nurturing stories is that because there are no endings or beginnings in the circles of our stories and the ongoing beauty of storytelling, however horrific the stories are, we must have mercy on ourselves, our thinking, and our attempts at writing. Perhaps my point today is that understanding the place of the Nekba as, event, as an event and the ongoing Nekba as the re lived reality and conceptual basis for being in and of Palestine is key to an exploration of ongoing return. As Elias Houdi and Rosemary Sayyid, among so many others, have shown us, the ongoing Nekba is a fundamental part of Palestinian survival. Specifically, Rosemary argues, and I quote, in, in conceptualizing the Nakba, I extend its temporality from the expulsions of 1948-49 up to the present day, end quote. Here we see Rosemary amending historical writing to include gathering stories from multiple generations into a more holistic inquiry of the ongoing Nakba. This intervention towards reconceptualization in addition to challenging a certain kind of politics about refugee research, is also a direct call for what history can be. In Rosemary's words again, quote, history, history work should not be about the past, not only about the past. Oral history is adapting to registering stories told by camp Palestinians, as well as telling what they want from history, end quote. In other words, she explains that history is a political project specifically, the stories that she refers to about the Nakba are an element of peoplehood and a kind of cultural property that needs to be recorded. And so field work is not just about recording or collecting people's experiences, but it's also about understanding why these kinds of collections matter and to whom they matter. And so as we move from the ongoing Nakba into ongoing return, we do not ignore the violence that is meant to not only eliminate us as a people, but in doing so, break our relationship with the land of Palestine. Return, or more specifically, the right of return, is a core part of Palestinian politics and has been since the forced expulsions of the Nakba War. Return, like Nakba, was actually a demand before the war because British colonial powers in support of the settler colonial enter enterprise in Palestine in the Mandate era had already been active in denying people a place in their homeland. While the right of return is certainly a part of ongoing return, that is the right for every Palestinian refugee to return to the homeland, ongoing return is also about relationality to our homeland, a means of continuously exploring our relation to the places from which we came and to which we belong. Ownership and property rights has distinct limitations in thinking about ongoing return because a return to the land that is based on property in terms of commodity and ownership, while born of a far longer colonial, leg colonial and capitalist legacy than Zionism, still reduces Palestinian belonging into a framework of colonial capitalism and the exclusivist politics of recognition. Moreover, since the advent of Zionism as an ideology and, the and since the first Zionist settlements in Palestine, a discussion of a strict sense of property rights as ownership, 
while logical for a people dispossessed, has nevertheless imposed a kind of competition between Zionist settlers and Palestinians. Capital modernity is a longer history in Palestine, one that Zionism, like other forms of settler colonialism, manipulated towards their own ends. While the logic of capital modernity, moreover, pontificates rightful ownership and connects that with a core feature of Zionist mythology and a Zionist connotation of Jewishness. That is, even within the framework of rights to be based on prior occupancy, Zionist claims of belonging translate into ownership of land based on their settler claims to ownership. Succumbing to this framework, Palestinians participate in a game of settler logics, whereby we are made to prove our belonging through the very means that dispossessed us from the land. If we imagine return through a means of capitalist commodification, we may eventually reproduce another kind of Palestinian displacement through contestations of belonging as property rights. Rather than confine our immediate sense of belonging to property, how can we liberate the past from the prison and work to forge relationality to the land as a part of our getting free? That is, what if we no longer work to recover history only as a register of property stolen, even though that is what it was. But what happens when we explore the richness of the past is the journey into understanding how we did, how we do, and how we will foster and nurture our ever-changing notions of belonging. What if we free belonging from the rumination of pro proper property ownership and think otherwise? Ongoing return held in the stories of Palestinians who endure the brutal violence of settler colonialism on the land and in exile is how we teach ourselves in the world that resistance is about love and belonging. Ongoing Nakba works to eliminate us and prevent our imaginations from thinking. The bombs attacking every living being in Gaza, the settler army and armies of settlers here in the West Bank, force us into a constant state of survival. But we are more than the ongoing Nakba. Ongoing return is our return to the land and our ongoing return to ourselves. Mine, like every Palestinian, is a story about belonging, not to claim the land as ours or mine, but to find ourselves through her and with her. So ongoing return holds the grief and the sadness and the utter depravity of the ongoing Nakba, but it does so with love, because love is a way of being and living is the core of our relation to the land and our relations to each other. We grieve because we love, we long for Palestine, because we belong to Palestine. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Elena, for this insightful and very heavy. Hello? Bye. Sorry. So I got some echo. Thanks for this insightful and very heavy um, intervention. Uh, I almost want to take a break. But we won't. Uh, I have a, just a couple questions. And let me just say that we will probably have some time for questions. So if people would like to share their questions uh, on YouTube, uh, if you can do that by adding the word uh, question or the letter Q up front, that'll be great. Rana, you mentioned a kind of a hesitation, not exactly like a refusal, but a hesitation of documentation and testimony as a kind of um, contradiction or peril, uh, potential peril for a historian. Can you expand on that a little bit and explain a little bit what you mean by, by that? Um, I can try. Um, it was heavy, wasn't it? Um, I'm not sure how to not be heavy today, so it's difficult. I think one of the things that's been really hard about this is talking, like I said earlier, talking through fire. Um, and the kind of implicit contradiction that I guess I just presented or tried to present between refusing this notion of documentation and, and testimony and testimonials to prove either that we existed or that we're victims. Um, but the utter necessity of it, and today, in the last 160 days, shows us um, and proves to us the utter necessity of this. So I don't actually have an answer to this question, even though we thought of it together. But I do have sort of material for us to be, think through together. Um, and I want to think through this out loud, actually, thinking about how we can try to 
differentiate between extractative and generative ways of research, ways of documentation, ways of being. It's not a chemical equation and it's not one plus one equals two. So I'm not sure where to lie on that, but I do want us to constantly think that question. And so thinking through this, I want to bring up three projects. Um, the first of these projects was um, is a project that's put up by put together by INSENIAT, the Society of Palestinian Anthropologists, and it's under the title Voices from Gaza. And I want to thank, um, as an outset, uh, Rima Hamami for talking me through this and for reminding me of the introduction to this project and how those who put it together used a really interesting framework. And here I'm going to quote from the website. This is the Insaniat website under Voices from Gaza in their project section. And this is quoting them. We humbly offer these voices from Gaza under siege that attest to Gazans' immense suffering, but also their unbounded courage and will to survive. Um, in the words of Gaza human rights lawyer, Raja Sorani, speaking from within the depths of this war, and here they quote Raja, I am so proud of my people, unbelievable courage and strength, I am proud of my people because with all of the might of Israel, the strongest army in the Middle East, towards Gaza, the 365 square kilometers, and after a blockade of 16 years in the most densely populated area on earth, which lacks everything, they are still strong, still surviving. We have death everywhere in the streets and the death comes from the sky, from the sea, from the artillery. They didn't give up. I'm very proud that I'm Gazan. I'm very proud that I'm Palestinian. Um, and with that framing, if you go through the voices, which I don't read as presented as testimonies, you can kind of see what I was trying to say, explored in real time. So there's a voice of um, one of the things is if you read backward, the messages are recorded from October. It's it's mind blowing um, because the thirst and the hunger and the fear and the violent, the fear of the violence and, and the destruction of it goes back until mid to, to early mid October. Um, and it feels like it's been a hundred years. One quote from a community worker under the name S um, wrote, we went to sleep in 2023 and woke up in 1948. Um, another, uh, another quote from the voices is Ali Jadallah, who's a photojournalist, and one of his quotes reads, each photo I capture narrates a story. Share them, tell the world what is happening in Gaza, and he signs it from Gaza with love. Uh, I think the, the way that this project is framed doesn't impose anything on these voices. Um, and it's storytelling. So that's one of the things. But it is also documentation, but it's not presented as testimony. The next thing that I could offer is what's already become a historical document, which is the most recent issue, the winter issue of Idrisat al-Palestinia, which is the Ang Arab language journal um, of the Institute of Palestine Studies. And this issue, which was specifically about Gaza and guess edited by um, Abdurrahim al-Sheikh pieces together all these different kinds of voices coming out of Palestine, not only Gaza, but in particular Gaza, from the introduction of Haider Eid um, into everything in this issue is important, but into this section that is um, a curated section of poetry. Um, and as a poet himself, I think that speaks in so many ways to what speaking about the violence without speaking against, um, without having to confront it or challenge or conform to it. And then finally, we have the things that all of us have been reading and, and witnessing, which is these incredible, what are now, I guess, journalists on social media, from Bissan to Lama to others who are telling their stories. Um, and they're storytelling. They're telling horrific stories, but they're telling stories. So I think that's one of the challenges of, you know, this is documentation, but it's not testimony. Um, and I guess that's the con one of the contradictions that I was trying to sort of think through um, with everybody. Um, 
Thanks, Elena. We will try to um, actually take questions if there are any, but I have a couple before that. And let me just say before we go on that um, those of you, uh, we have actually a lot of viewers now online and uh, some have asked if, um, if they can catch the beginning of this uh, uh, conversation or, you know, presentation and teaching. So you can go to palestineandcontext.org and uh, you will find this event uh, in video under teach-ins, uh, literally, you know, by this evening. And you can also review everything else that has happened. So this is the 25th teach-in uh, and you will be able to watch all of them actually, as well as the, there's another 12 to 14 podcasts, uh, video podcasts or video conversations like teachings, but uh, they're, they're um, not teachings per se. And then there are about nine or 10 podcasts, audio pod podcasts on the heavy period in the middle of like November, December, um, which actually chronicles what was happening on the ground as well as other material. Now, let me just ask you another question, uh, Arana, um, and it's about what you mentioned about love and belonging as a framework for understanding the past and the present in, in Palestine. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder if this is a way we can understand resistance uh, over the longer period. I was going to say longer durée, but I'm not going to be pretentious. Um, <laughs> If so, how can you navigate through today's present and how can this help us think about what what should or can come next? Uh, you know, it's very difficult to always talk about what is going to happen when the dust settles because the dust is not settling and people yeah. are continue to be killed. So, but if you can just shed some light on this. Um, I can try. I think... Um... I just want to I want to acknowledge um, all of 25. That's insane. 25, and those are just the teachings. So yeah, this is you know, this is acknowledging you. This you've been it's you've it's been a, carrying it's a, a lot of the load of this. So it's a huge that's really important. it's a huge group of uh, collaborators. Yeah. Always the wrong it word is. to use. Uh, institutional and mainly university units. Um, and I've always said and emphasized that there are a ton of people working in the background, putting things online, tweeting as we speak, uh, or Xing, whatever it is, and uh, sharing this material and disseminating and so on and so forth. So I always thank them towards the end. I'll thank them now because without them, I don't think any of what we are doing is possible, not just here, but almost anywhere. And and for some reason, the, their labor is not acknowledged. So, So thanks to all of these folks. Yeah, maybe we can actually fold that into the power of our voices and how that's part of ongoing return because what we're doing now here um, is also creating stories and nurturing our own stories. So to speak to the question that you asked, it was I thought about this a lot because I'm not a I'm not ready to talk about sort of what what it means to think about what comes next. Um, Cause as you said, I, we don't know what next is and every day brings worse. So it's become thinking about just you know, settle a colonial goal, thinking about tomorrow becomes a frightening part of living through today. But I think if we think about relationality to place and our relationality to the land and how that's changed over time, but it's always based on this notion of belonging, which I think it is. Um, I thought about this because it's, it's, it's part of my next project, which is about thinking about the Barak revolt, which happened in 1929, and thinking about how that History is not something that repeats itself, but rather it's something that is also ongoing. So when we think about resistance, we're put into a position of blame in various places, and we are actually blamed. The criminalization of resistance is a historical phenomenon, as well as a current one. And part of that is being put into a position of condemnation. And that's just not a framework that I think is either productive or ours. It's us fitting into, it's like the circles into the lines again, or square pegs. Um, so if we think about ongoing return, we can actually point to what Haidar Eid pointed out really early on, is that, you know, a lot of, you know, the march of return from Gaza, 
um, up until October of 2023 was that people are constantly practicing return. And that's part of the resistance. Um, and on October 7th, what happened in part was that people were returning to their to their homelands. That's something that was lost in all of the violence that came before and after, but that's actually really true. And it's something that's worth remembering and worth thinking about. Um, and so if we think about, rather than theorizing resistance or even thinking about it tactically, which is another conversation for another time, if we think about who we are as generated from our belonging, then we work through all of this it, with this notion of love and belonging to the place. And that means that that's how we work, right? That's how we are as Palestinians. And that works in the context of exile as well as it works in the context of internal exile. Those of us who live on parts of the lands of Palestine but cannot actually nurture being in a relationship and relations with the land of Palestine. So I'm just sort of thinking aloud that ongoing return, like I said, or like I'm trying to say is that it, it includes the right of return, which is a core principle of Palestinian politics, but it's also sort of trying to stretch that. And also in the stretching of it, trying to challenge it. And so stretching it is, this can be how we think about not only how the settle, how settler colonial violence tries to break our relation to the land, but how we work to maintain and nurture and forge relations with the land. So that helps us understand events from Barak revolt until now and helps us understand um, the long the long story of survival and resistance. Um, and hopefully it helps us sort of try to think as well um, that survival is also starting to forge into sort of what we will be and how we can be. And so that's preventing or denying the prevention of thinking in the Palestinian futures. And that becomes a different kind of way of thinking and a modality, right? So if return in, in the case of my my own self in the book that I described earlier is about returning to a village in the northwest corridor of Jerusalem called Lifta. Um, but I can't think about returning in the in in the in the property sense because that will bring up a lot of problems. So what does it mean that we have to collectively think about return together? And what does that mean in our relationship to the, our relations to the place? how we honor the past, how we survive the present in order to forge a future. Um, I, don't have any, I don't have any answers to those questions, but I'm, what I'm trying to say simply is that posing that as a framework for understanding the past is, it, it, it feels like a way of thinking outside of settler colonial violence, but not obfuscating it, obviously. Thanks, Rena. Um, I think uh, I'm going to ask my last question. And it could very well be that we will actually be able to hit the hour mark, which is what I usually promise guests. And yeah. I'm always lying because it goes over. So if we don't get, uh, I mean, the audience is really sharing a lot of, you know, great feedback. Um, but if there are no questions, this is one of my final questions. Mm -hmm. um, if you can, um, you, you, how can ongoing return, which is the title, uh, as mm -hmm. you address it and explain it, uh, hold space for uh, the various generations, the three generations of Palestinians who have been denied return so far, uh, or the right of return? Is there a space in this conversation for reconciliation and accountability and um and how, how might this play out? Um, Especially I think, if I can say mm -hmm. like, like sort of sure. a follow up, but I'll do it now. Mm -hmm. You know, especially we have to be very blunt, especially mm -hmm. after this series of massacres, which mm -hmm. of course the Palestinians are getting the, you know, uh, uh, are getting massacred in, in those, you know, tens of thousands of, right. uh, in terms of numbers. But also on both sides, I mean, there seems to be uh, a bigger rift than ever, right? Uh, even mm -hmm. though it was always uh, a wide rift. So that context also makes, you know, I mean, should make accountability easier, but mm. perhaps reconciliation harder. 
Um, I think the thing is, I, you know, I don't want to sound facetious here, but I think the rift was always there. I think that the settler native yeah. binary is, um, is one that is, you know, settler colonial violence is defined by this. And I, so that binary just, is the only binary the, that's there. Because yeah. I'm so interested in hearing your, your response. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, there are conceptions that many of us would advance regarding mm -hmm. a one state solution, you know, mm -hmm. this is what I'm referring to. I'm, I'm referring to sort of responses that, you know, we follow on the news, we read blogs and, and really intimate things from the local setting, not from the outside mm -hmm. in framework. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the things one hears, um, put some of these suggestions about a potential, you know, equitable democratic, um, collective solution. It, it just makes it that much harder after what we have experienced and witnessed. That's what I mean. Yeah, I, I, I understand. I, and I, and I agree with you, I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, you're seeing, I've been, I've been, I, like a lot of other people have been struggling with the level of fascism that is coming out of Israeli society. That's not to say I didn't expect it to be fascist or violent. It's just I didn't expect it to be this no holds barred yeah. um, or this this rid ridiculously audacious. So I think the, the surprise for me hasn't been the violence of, of Zionists. The surprise for me has been, and I, and I have to admit this, is that we live in a world that doesn't care. That's been the surprise for me. So I think, Manny, I think when I think about this, I think, you know, you know, oftentimes um, within indigenous comparisons, uh, in either settler colonial studies or native studies, people, um, and this is part of the what I try to work through in, in talking about uh, indigeneity in the Palestinian context, is that oftentimes the demographic question comes up, obviously. Right, it comes up. The demographic question is really multi-layered, and it's, there's a lot to talk about. But one of the main lines that people say, um, and there's some logic to this, I suppose, is that the Nakba War and Nakba and the Zionist project was a much later settler colonial project. That is the late 19th century into the 20th century. And the reason that the demographic elimination or attempts at elimination didn't happen in ways that they happened for other indigenous peoples and other geographies was because of the world that we lived in, was because of sort of these red lines that were part of what would the so-called international community. And I think that's been shattered. I think that's what you're speaking to. And I think it's important for us to sort of sit there and think about this. So one of the ways that I could engage the question is thinking about accountability and reconciliation, not as sort of thinking about how Palestinians will have to find a solution for settler anxieties. That, that's just been put on exposed, constant live stream. I mean, one of the things that I don't have the, I actually don't have the, the ability to go through are these kind of, uh, all of this stuff out on social media of not only the Zionist, you know, not only the military plans of what's being, of what's happening in Gaza, but how it's been celebrated on tech, on TikToks, on social media. It's disgusting and it's, it's dis difficult to think through and about humanity with that. So when I think about accountability and reconciliation, I'm thinking about being held accountable to Arifa, my grandmother, who was kicked out of Lifta. Um, reconciliation and accountability is holding space for my mother, who gave me these stories, um, who lives in Chicago. Accountability and reconciliation is thinking about three generations of Palestinians who, who lingered in exile and thinking about the way that I need to think about the world and need to think about myself as a Palestinian and, and knowledge sharing in the Palestinian context is being held accountable to them and acknowledging that. So it's true. I mean, ongoing return has to hold these three generations of peoples who haven't been, who've been denied this basic right of return. And what does that mean? And what does that mean when I think about it conceptually? Um, and I try to present it as an ontology. I mean, that's something that I want to be held and I need to be held accountable to. And so stories being circular stories are like what we, what I was trying to say earlier. It's about connecting ourselves to these pasts and making those connections for the future. 
we have to be held accountable to the next generation of Palestinians. With regards to settler violence, I honestly think, and this is going to sound crazy, but I honestly think the level of violence that has happened over the last 160 days, and as you mentioned earlier, it does not seem like it's ending, um, is a historical watershed. It's, it's how empires end. And I think that's what's happening, and I think it's going to take some time, and I think it's going to be bloody and even more bloody than it's been, but I think we're living through a watershed historical moment, and I think this is an empire ending. Which empire? The American empire hmm. <laughs> that supports the Zionist state of Israel. Thanks for this. Um, how's, that, have... how's that for a last comment? <laughs> no, it's not the last comment. We have a question, actually, um, and there may be more. Um, so we're, we still have a few minutes um, because we, we, you know, uh, we will be as an hour in about seven minutes or so. Um, so the question is. Uh, and I was afraid that I talked for too long. لا, okay. Not at all. We have a question from uh, Sally Jones. We sometimes say the names. Discussions online regarding settler communities always seem to say that it's now impossible, you know, for them to be evicted. And, and the question is, why Why not? I mean, if we are, you know, taking the premise of the question that these discussions online are, mm -hmm. yeah, are saying that this is the case. I don't understand. What's the case that settlers that, won't leave? Yeah, that, that now it's becoming more impossible to evict settlers, mm -hmm. like after, mm -hmm. you know, Gaza. Mm hmm I mean, don't you think it's the other wise way? I realize, I mean, let, let's think about this together, you and I, Bassam. The fact that they're so exposed, the fact that this violence has been so bloody, has been so ridiculously fascist, has been so unlimited and bound, boundless. The liberal face, whatever it was in reality, but the liberal facade of settler, settler colonialism in Palestine has fallen. We spent, historians spent, years trying to deconstruct this liberal face, right? And try to say that it's what it is, which is eliminatory. Now they're, the, now what's happening is the settler state in this campaign is openly embracing its fascism and all of the violence that goes along with it. So it's not about, I think the thing is, and this is something that a lot of people who have said much more sophisticated and eloquently than I before this, but understanding from the river to the sea is not about expelling anybody at all. Neither is Palestinian history in the way that I'm trying to describe it. Ongoing return is about Palestinians establishing, reestablishing, and, and, and maintaining relations with the land. When settlers um, decide to stop being settlers, it's not, uh, it's not incumbent upon me to help them to do that. It's not about expelling. And if, as long as settlers describe this as an expulsion, expulsion, then that means that they're not coming to terms with what settler colonial has been in the past and what it continues to be in the present. And so I don't have very much to say or engage with that question because it's not, um, it's not the reality that I live and it's not the reality that I think all of us live. Um, I think what you were saying earlier is struggling with try to trying to think about how to think through accountability and reconciliation on the land of Palestine with all the feet that are here is a conversation that just can't be had right now. But the reason that it can't be had right now isn't because of Palestinian ongoing return. The reason that it can't be had right now is, is, a, is, a, is a coming to terms with themselves in terms of the settler colonial state and the utter violence that it's just led to right now. And I think there's a real, I think that's the watershed moment. I think there's a real sort of realization, perhaps, if I can say that, worldwide and internally here of just how incredibly violent Zionist settler colonialism is. And I think that that's the conversation that's starting to be had. I don't know what's happening on these settler forums online, but I see that as the, the conversation that's happening. That is a useful and generative one. Did you want me to think on this with you? Sure. Yes. I mean, because you asked me, um, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. not the guest, so... I, I don't know enough, but, uh, 
you know, I, I understand the question in a way because I, I see a Janice faced situation here. Mm -hmm. I usually never actually in the, in these conversations say very much. So you, you're inviting me. So this is why I'm saying it. Um, I, I want to hear what you have to I talk say. About I want to hear your thoughts. I talk about other administrative stuff that 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 sometimes takes too long. Um, I think I think on the one hand, yes, you're right. Uh, it seems that this should be now easier because at some level, Israel and the United States, of course, might not be able to come back from this to the status quo ante regarding the liberal discourse about Israel, at least in relation to those who actually supported that discourse, mm -hmm. which is evidenced now by the fact that you see so many millions of people right. changing their tune and changing their mind on what they thought Israel was globally. Mm -hmm. But you see very, 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 very few people moving the, in the other direction. So that's at the level of discourse. So right. in, in that sense, yes. But if you look at, and, and I am someone who does, if you look at what's happening inside Israeli society mm -hmm. closely on the real things that are, you know, policies and things of the sort on quote unquote highbrow things like serious articles and things that are, you know, considered quote unquote serious. And if you look at social media where you have everything, um, there is an emboldenment that's taking place. There, there, there is an emboldening that has taken place, which you know, potentially is what some people are speaking to that says or suggests that this can be done in some form also in the West Bank, which means to reproduce the status quo in a way that prevents any sort of reversal. So so I, I see both points, you know, uh, but ultimately I, I, I do agree that, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be very difficult to maintain th those narratives. And if one would venture to guess, uh, it's also going to be very difficult for this quote unquote, you know, settler racist project to, uh, to live for long. Uh, and the word long here is, is, is elastic. Um, I don't know. I just want to, Annie, this is a conversation. So I just want to you know, engage what you said really quickly and, and, and say that there's two things here. I mean, I think that, like I said earlier, I think this is a watershed. It's a terrible, terrible price that Palestinians in particular, in general, and Palestinians in Gaza have paid for this watershed, but it is a watershed. And I think the kind of mobilization happening globally has, is, is, is unprecedented as well. And I think that this is generational and I think it's, it's popular and it's mass. And it's because, there, because, unfortunately, it's because of the level of violence that hasn't affected the seats of power yet. But politics has to sort of eventually, it can't not matter. This kind of mobilization cannot not matter. Where it's going to lead and how it will change things is for the elasticity that you're talking about. But I think that's where we can, where we can turn. And the other thing is just the level of devastation that has been visited upon the whole place of Gaza. It's important for us to remember that the very early days, we're talking October 8th and 9th, you know, the, the Israeli, the war cabinet, as soon as it was formed, said it was going to cut off water and electricity. And it said it was going to do what it's done. And what it's done is completely decimate the entirety of Gaza. That too has to matter. And it will matter. Unfortunately, it was a really heavy price to pay, but at that kind of, that level of violence, that level of destruction, um, there's not a university left standing. I teach at Beauty's 8, uh, and we're already thinking about what Gaza means as you are, what, what higher education means, what secondary education means. There's been a complete, and people are coming up with new words right now because genocide's not enough to hold what's happened. That too will be will be recorded historically. And that has to matter as well. Um, all right, we're, we just hit the hour mark. Um, I would like to uh, see if you have any other final words that you'd like to part with. 
knowing that you might, and I hope you do, because uh, there's right now there's a really odd mixture. And of course, you know, those of us who are not living in Palestine, um, you know, are, are watching from afar, but, but there's a mixture, you know, even here of uh, despair, uh, anger and exhaustion, right? So, um, and there's so much happening and, and, and so much to follow and so much to read and to listen to and to engage with and to organize and to mobilize and so on. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a particular moment now after five months of, of, of slaughter. Any, uh, any, you know, last words given, frankly, given where you're speaking from, which is Ramallah and the West Bank, anything that um, you'd like to share before we part? Um. I don't know, actually, because I worked so hard on what I tried to share at the beginning. Um, it was wrought and it was heavy. Um, and I, I will not apologize for that because that's where we're at right now. But I think what I've been saying since before October is what I want to say now is that, you know, the violence is, is obviously devastating, debilitating and paralyzing. But this notion of relationality is something that I've held on to. It's something that I've learned in seeking, in seeking Arifa, my grandmother, and learning from Adla, my mother. It's that, and, and this is a line that I've said so often that I feel like a broken record, but it's one I think that captures everything, which is that we belong to Palestine, and that can't ever be broken, however hard they try. All right. Thank you, Rana. Lots of uh, uh, interest in what you've been saying, and those who are joining late at different on different platforms, um, you know, can actually you could, especially on on Twitter. I mean, on Twitter alone, there's you know more than six hundred uh, viewers now. You can actually go back to that same video you're watching and just rewind on Twitter, or on or on X, uh, on the Jadalia handle, which is at Jadalia with double Y, or you could go to palestineincontext.org and, and watch everything, uh, again. And, uh, uh, thank you, uh, again, Rana for, for your insights and for, uh, more than insights. I don't know what to call it. I don't have words for it, but you know, for, for the human being that, that you are and the things that you are sharing as a, as a person. Uh, not just as a scholar. Thank you very much for that. And um, we hope to speak with you soon. Uh, again, uh, you know, we we, uh, we are in touch constantly, so I, I know I'll speak with you soon. Um, yeah. And uh, let me just also say that uh, next week, we are starting a um, sort of a co-sponsored series on uh, the tight under the title in defense of academic freedom with a number of other organizations, uh, which Gaza and Context Project will uh, be a part of. And uh, we are hoping to speak with people, especially faculty on campuses in the United States, but potentially beyond, uh, who are being targeted for um, for their speech. Uh, and in almost all the cases that I have seen, the speech uh, that they've been targeted for is something that everybody shares, but you know, uh, some people are actually being targeted specifically, and we are going to feature them and have conversations with them as well as with others and institutions who are working on this topic, because this is essentially part of the next phase of things here. Uh, and I am sure that we uh, have witnessed, uh, others have witnessed this elsewhere. And we just heard about um, uh, a case in in uh, inside Israel where somebody was suspended. Um, so we we are uh, a faculty member. So we are going to be working on uh, on this track as well. And uh, again, thanks to everybody who co-sponsored this, all of the twenty two plus co-sponsors, uh, and all the people that put this together. And thanks to Yolana and the viewers who are engaging with us and have been extremely supporters, supportive of uh, what we have been doing. Have a wonderful um, day, I guess. Yeah, take that. Yeah. Thank you. Allah Thank you. Allah Thanks everyone. Salam.